health care. Um, I am fond of dividing the world into three points, no, kind of no matter, they change depending on what I'm talking about, but there's always three. And the three points here really are that health care should always do one of three things. It should relieve suffering. It should prevent future suffering or it should prolong life. I'll just pause there for a minute. Those are my three things. That's what health care is about. Relieving suffering, preventing future suffering, prolonging life. I've spent much of my academic work in the world of preventive services, and so the prevent future suffering is the area where I have spent most of my time. And I actually believe that, um, as we are fond of saying, you can't improve on asymptomatic, or you can't make somebody who feels well feel better. Um, the evidence bar should be a bit higher. So speaking of that, to do this, any one of these three things, healthcare providers and their patients must make good decisions. The question is, how do we make good decisions? With due homage or attribution to Brian Haynes from 2002, I'm almost assuredly have prostituted his uh, diagram from back then, uh, but I also wanted to provide attribution. We start with the patient in front of us with a particular set of, of circumstances, a, a life existence, if you will, and then the clinical state. And we bring to that some science. We'd like to believe that we bring to that some science. And indeed, particularly um, in the latter half of my career, more than the first half, to be perfectly honest, uh, patient preferences came into play. Our goal, of course, is to hit the sweet spot. We want to find just that uh, spot that fits that particular patient that is supported by the science and is consistent with their personal preferences, and we like to think that clinical expertise is what allows us to get there. <clears throat> the problem, of course, is that so often we're faced with a clinical state and circumstances for which we really don't have the science to tell us what to do. But I will say that with due haste, with due haste, Oh, I'm sliding down, maybe even disappearing. Is that better? I can hear myself just fine. Wave your hand in the very back if you can hear that. OK, you didn't miss much. <coughs> if, you, if you're following the slides, you got most of the message, really, so far. So you're, you're in good shape. But, but now you're going to have to listen, because it gets actually more tricky. Clinical expertise moves very rapidly to fill that gap. And of course, science moves in significantly slower. And unfortunately, the patient preferences move in even more slowly in terms of the way we process our clinical decisions. As a matter of fact, clinical expertise moves in so fast that it, it completely fills up that circle. And so we know what to do all the time with all of our patients um, without a touch of science being involved. The problem then, of course, is what happens when you actually bring science into the equation. And as you can see there, the science sometimes actually overlaps with clinical expertise, um, but never completely overlaps with clinical expertise. The, the nirvana, of course, is to be right there in the comfortable zone where the science that you bring to the equation, in fact, tells us exactly what we already knew. And then the people who already knew it say, well, you didn't really need to do that research. We already knew that. Um, but unfortunately, we also find ourselves in the uncomfortable zone sometimes where the science that we bring to the equation actually lives on the other side, and it's not reinforcing to what we already know to be truth. That is my edge. In the postcards from the edge, I'm going to focus on that border where we're hanging out in the uncomfortable zone, sort of approaching the clinical expertise, but not getting there. So what is the best science to bring to a clinical decision? I'd like to reference again uh, Jean Daly, uh, who I don't know. She wrote a book entitled Evidence-Based Medicine in the Search for a Science of Clinical Care. And I felt like she was sort of writing without even knowing me my sort of biography of my professional journey as it relates uh, to science. It's quite a good history for those who are interested in history. That's what it is. It's history. Um, and I didn't start in the 60s, parenthetically. Actually, I did start in the 50s, but that was my sort of original start. Um, but I wasn't practicing in the 60s, though I am a, a child of the 60s. And in many, many ways, being a child of the 60s uh, shapes you for the rest of your life. No, I didn't inhale. And <laughs> in the 60s, there was unrest about clinical care. 
Actually, there was unrest about everything in the 60s, for those of you who weren't there. And in the 60s, the science that we brought to the bedside, advances in medicine came from the lab. The tradition of scholarly medicine was from the lab to the bedside. I mean, literally, it was sort of way most, not to get too crude about this, but I always really like doing a KOH and a wet prep. It's because it's like, it makes me feel like William Osler, right? I'm going to the lab and I'm studying something under the microscope and then I get to go back to the exam room and use what I just studied under the microscope. It feels very, very cool. Master clinicians knew the basic sciences, that is what we can learn from the lab and applied them at the bedside. Perhaps no relationship, but a motto of the 1960s was think for yourself and question authority. And so these people who were questioning the clinical science back then almost assuredly were less than 30 and not trusting anybody over 30. Questions were being asked about the validity of using traditional clinical authority as the basis for clinical decision making and there were no grounds for appeal except by reference to the very authority that was being questioned. Which brings us to the 70s which was the development and the evolution of clinical epidemiology. When I first heard the term clinical epidemiology, it sort of felt like a funny term because it really wasn't epidemiology as I thought uh, epidemiology was, but it was the evolution of the science of clinical decisions. And there's a whole bunch to this, and I don't have time obviously, but most all of this critical thought and evolution of science of clinical care led to a uniform conclusion which was the randomized control trial is the best method to determine the effectiveness of interventions in achieving specific health outcomes. Now, there are going to be some people in the audience who want to challenge that, I promise you. And um, <clears throat> there's much more to the science of clinical care than randomized controlled trials. But when you're talking about the effectiveness of intervention, a well-conducted RCT is the gold standard. This is a, a I created this a couple years ago. I searched Medline, think PubMed, think whatever it is that you use to search the, the literature and used only as my keyword randomized controlled trials. On the left side of the graph is 1971 to 1975, me in college. The next bar over is 1976 to 1980, roughly um, <coughs> me uh, in uh, medical school. The next bar over 1981 to 85, sort of me finishing residency and doing a fellowship, et cetera. But you can see the exponential growth and randomized clinical trials. On the left side of the bar, between 1971 and 1975 total, there were fewer than 5,000 articles in the literature with a key word for randomized controlled trials, all the way to the right side from 2006 to 2010, where there are 90,000 of those. Very important things happened in 1981 and 1985. I'm sure that you won't necessarily agree with that, but a couple of things happened. I finished my residency and decided that well, this was probably a good time uh, to go ahead. I had always thought about taking a, a dive into academic medicine and it seemed like a convenient time. I did a, one of the few Robert Wood Johnson fellowships in academic family medicine at the time. Had uh, n uh, notable colleagues uh, in, in that uh, effort. Um, uh, Steve Zweig, who is now my boss and chair at, at University of Missouri and um, Bernard de Wigman. Uh, who was now the chair at the University of Chicago, Jared Cruz, the former chair at SIU, now the dean at SIU, and me. And that's good. I didn't follow that pathway, and that is also good. In 1983, because I was a fellow, they gave me the opportunity to go to STFM in Boston and NAPCRAG in Banff. And with all due respect to all of my friends and family from Boston, I prefer Banff. <laughs> and managed, after all those years, my, my wife uh, at the time had to choose between Boston and Banff. We were only going to get to go to one place, and she played a Haynes flute in the Haynes factories in Boston, so I'll go to Boston. What a critical mistake. And finally, 40 years later, we celebrated our anniversary this uh, August in Banff. Bernard finished the fellowship um, just a little after me because he took a year out to go play around in Africa. I don't think he considered it playing around, but he came back and he started asking questions. He said, maybe, maybe we should look at this question. Does routine ultrasound of pregnancy improve outcomes? That was our question in 1985. It may seem like a mundane question now, but ultrasound was just taking off. Mind you, in the, when I was 
just started residency in ultrasound image. It looked a little bit like a Rorschach, actually. That's, um, it, technology was improving, it was rapidly accelerating, and we had people out there advocating for ultrasound at every obstetric visit. And we said, maybe we should do a randomized controlled trial. And that, indeed, was probably an adventure in naivete. Um, but we decided to do that. Uh, Bernard, as the principal investigator, we started with a pilot study, um, enlisted the support of our maternal fetal expert right there at the University of Missouri. Uh, we did just first trimester ultrasound because all we really were going to be interested in was how many babies and how far along. Uh, we got the pilot study done. We decided to write a grant to the NIH. They were going to do the big trial now. And just, in fact, as we were submitting that grant, um, our maternal fetal medicine person left, and we were left with no obstetric backup. So we went to Wash U, enlisted Jim uh, Crane, uh, James Crane at, the, um, at Wash U in maternal fetal medicine to support us, and so he did. And so we went in on a grant to the NIH, and unbeknownst to us at the same time, uh, Fred Frigoletto at Harvard was submitting a grant uh, for routine ultrasound in pregnancy. The NIH said, let's get you guys together and see if we can do a trial. Uh, and we did. It, um, uh, did the appropriate uh, sample size calculations, which were 15,500. We had three clinical centers, and one of the lessons is the research is very hard work. And you know, creating the idea and making up how you're going to do it, and then analyzing your results are the bookends to a lot of grunt work, as it turns out. And that included for us the grunt work of going around because our practice center was actually a, a practice-based trial, and we had to, I felt like a pharmaceutical representative going around to physician's offices, sitting in the waiting room with my coat and tie and my briefcase, waiting for 15 minutes with the doctor to say, would you please, please, please be in our study? And nonetheless, <clears throat> we made it. And in September of 1993, published these results of the RADIUS trial. By the way, we spent an entire day in Washington, D.C., coming up with the acronym. That is, in fact, one of the hard parts of doing research. And what did that study show? <clears throat> Screening ultrasonography did not improve perinatal outcome as compared with the selective use of ultrasonography on the basis of clinical judgment. No difference. Not even, not even well, there's a difference there, but it's just not statistically significant. Just no difference. So I don't see how much gray hair I see out there. <clears throat> Guess or recall the response of the obstetric community. A, finally, some science to guide us. <laughs> B, doesn't apply to my patients. My experience tells me otherwise. C, clearly these sonographers were not any good. I was one of the sonographers, by the way. I took that kind of personally. So this is sort of an early experience of a postcard from the edge where, where science confronts clinical care. I don't think this study actually went to waste. I, I do think it uh, put the brakes on sort of widespread adoption and more judicious use of obstetric ultrasound. Of course, we don't have the same tool today that we had back then. But one of the messages here is if you don't like the message, shoot the messenger. And of course, it takes only, I, I like to tell my students, if, if you have a very strongly held belief, it only takes one very poorly done study to convince you that you are correct. <coughs> And if you have a very strongly held belief, it takes multiple well-conducted, large multicenter randomized controlled trials to convince you that you are wrong, sometimes. So what else was happening in the 1980s besides we were doing a randomized controlled trial? Actually, the 80s were the real transition to evidence-based medicine. The old paradigm, unsystematic observations from clinical experience were a valid way of building and maintaining knowledge about clinical care with a high value on authority. Now, I, I grew up in the 60s, and so I, I, I didn't think that that was a good thing, high value on authority, until I became old and gray and decided a high value on authority is a really good thing. <laughs> and, and because I said so is really pretty good. But it is very old paradigm. In the old paradigm, the study of basic principles and mechanisms of disease are a sufficient guide to clinical practice and good medical training and common sense allow you to be appropriately critical about the medical literature. And of course, the challenge to that is that all three of those are wrong. 
In the new paradigm, the new goal is the conscientious, explicit, and judicious use of current best evidence in making decisions about the care of individual patients. And that new paradigm was then labeled evidence-based medicine. And actually, those words were first used by Gordon Guyad in the literature, in terms of published literature, in 1991 in the ACP Journal Club. And then we were fleshed out by the McMaster Group in 1992. I think it's many people today would be somewhat dumbfounded to think that what we know and accept and believe as evidence-based medicine has been around for maybe 25 years, or at least the label evidence-based medicine has only been around since 1992. Task force. The first USPSDF, by the way, after I got appointed to the task force, the first thing I had to do was to go to my bedroom by myself and practice saying USPSDF. <laughs> <laughs> and just, just once now, everybody together, just to make sure that you, just to make sure that you're still with me, I want you to say USPSDF. Go ahead, try it. That was terrible. Uh, really, really bad. Convened under the auspices of the US Public Health Services, and it was chaired by Bob Lawrence, who was chief of medicine at Harvard, at Cambridge Hospital in Harvard. And I had a chance to visit with Mike McGinnis, who was one of the key players in the public health service to kind of make sure that this came through. And it was kind of very, very fascinating to see what his motivation and others were at the time. And ironically, in spite of the fact that I stand up on the stage over and over and over again and say, we don't consider coverage, we don't consider coverage, we don't consider money, because we don't consider money and we don't consider coverage, he said, we wanted to get coverage. <clears throat> and he said, there was a science out there. Keep in mind, when I started, OK, you know when that was now, right? I mean, I was in residency 7982. No preventive services had any third party payer. It was like putting a smoke alarm in your kitchen. No, the, your insurance company pays you when your house burns down. It doesn't pay you to put a smoke alarm in your kitchen. And that's the paradigm um, in the 80s. And, and, and McGinnis and others said, you know, there's good science out there supporting some preventive services. Maybe if we show people this science, then maybe some payers will start to pay for that. And the Guide to Clinical Preventive Services, a book. It was a book. We finally have the answer. It was published in 1989. I kept it on my shelf uh, for a very, very long time. Mind you, that was before, that was before the words evidence-based medicine were used for the first time. So the task force was actually out on the cutting edge, as I actually would submit that they still are, in terms of the science to inform clinical decisions, particularly the science to inform clinical preventive services. And that preceded the words evidence-based medicine. In the 1990s, we saw the rise of clinical guidelines. Clinical guidelines were not new. What was new was the evolution of the scientific methods required to produce evidence-based guidelines that result from a very explicit methodology. The contrasting approaches to clinical guidelines, well, I don't even have the one on here, which is the high value on authority. I've been studying this all my life. I've been taking care of patients with this all my life. I can tell you what to do. The but there is overlap between the traditional consensus-based or expert opinion process and the explicit evidence-based structured approach. And I've been in both of those rooms. The advantage to the left side of the screen is it's fast, it's easy, and it's cheap. You gather experts, individuals who have done research, published, or are otherwise assumed to be familiar with the science, or clinicians who commonly treat a disease. You put them in a room, and you say, here are the questions, give us the answers. And 24 hours later, you have the answers. I have actually been in many of those rooms because very often they, there's a who's who and a who's he. And they want your token primary care physician in the room because they want to influence primary care physicians, so they bring one. <laughs> and that's the who's he. And so my, one of my favorite, you can't read it there, was when the CDC put together a, a panel on the diagnosis and treatment of hemochromatosis. And I sat in a hotel room in Atlanta, this was convened by the CDC, talking about hemochromatosis. I was sitting with a bunch of people that I was concerned, I was concerned that if that hotel burned down, that most of the knowledge of hemochromatosis in America would disappear, <laughs> and me. And you can guess which one I was more concerned about. 
It didn't take us long. 24 hours later, we knew what to do. But evidence-based, the systematic evidence-based clinical guidelines were actually embraced by the family medicine community. It was in the 90s where I first was on a, a subcommittee to the research committee for STFM that said, look, this is a growing movement. We need to talk about what we're going to do about clinical guidelines. I was then the liaison to the scientific, uh, this commission on science for the AAFP, and then was served on the commission on science for the AAFP, and sort of my, my sort of scholarly evolution um, ended up more in the synthesis than the original uh, research world. Evidence-based guidelines were embraced by family medicine well ahead of most of the rest of the disciplines in medicine. And you can't help but wonder if that's related to this right here, which was when the, when the specialty was refounded. I actually, I feel very strongly that my roots are in general practice. And if somebody asks me, are you a general practitioner? I just say yes. Um, I, don't, I don't say no, I'm a family physician. Those were the bad old days and these are the good old days. But having said that, can family medicine really be a specialty without a science? I mean, that was the talk in academic centers because all the specialties were an outgrowth of a scientific body of knowledge rather than a, an approach to clinical care. And those were all advances in a, what I will call a reductionist science. Research and guidelines, particularly the systematic evidence-based guidelines, are a risky business. And one of my favorite journals I should say issues of journals was the April 17th, 1997 New England Journal of Medicine. Now I'm going to point to a couple of things from there. The first was a sounding board, the messenger under attack, intimidation of researchers by special interest groups. They got a postcard from the edge at AHCPR. There was a number of examples in this sounding board about this threat, but one related to, in fact, uh, the effort, HCPR, by the way, for you young people, <laughs> is ARC, right? Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. In its first iteration, it was the Agency for Healthcare Research and Policy. And as a researcher at the time, I was disappointed that it was the healthcare policy and research instead of the healthcare research and policy until somebody pointed out to me that ACPR is a lot nicer acronym than ah crap. <laughs> so, nonetheless, one of the tasks of ACPR at the time was to found the EPC movement, the EPC centers, the evidence-based practice centers, and to do systematic reviews. They did a systematic review of spinal surgery and pointed out that there was no evidence to support any of the things that the spinal surgeons were doing. They did not take that well. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, they took it so poorly, uh, they took it to Congress and nearly accomplished defunding the agency. Nearly accomplished getting rid of that agency completely. A near-death experience based on what I will call a postcard from the edge. In the same issue, one of my very favorite editorials of all time was written by Suzanne Fletcher. It was prescient for me. Not, it, it was forecasting my future. And it was a reflection on the 1997 NIH-NCI consensus panel on mammography, which actually they decided and published that there really wasn't evidence to support mammography for women aged 40 to 49. She was uh, subpoenaed to go to Congress and widely criticized. And, a lot of stuff happened. Indeed, she published this editorial called Wither Scientific Deliberation Health Policy Recommendations, Alice in the Wonderland of Breast Cancer Screening. And I will read the introduction to you. <coughs> Let the jury consider their verdict, verdict, the king said, for about the 20th time that day. No, no, said the queen. Science first, sentence first, verdict afterwards. Stuff and nonsense said Alice loudly. The idea of having the sentence first? Hold your tongue, said the queen, turning purple. I won't, said Alice. Off with her head, the queen shouted at the top of her voice. That's what it's like to publish about mammography. The new millennium. <laughs> Verdict first. 
The new millennium, the third U.S. Preventive Services Task Force was created. The first two were actually, we're going to do this for a while, we're going to reach the truth, we're going to publish a book, and then we're going to be done. And they decided that that actually doesn't work. You actually have to update this over time, and we moved to a continuous process. And it was actually authorized, the task force was authorized by Congress. Um, and um, a series of articles published in 2001, including a sentinel paper by Russ Harris, describing a methodology which became the basis for the procedure manual today. And if you are actually really, really, really are having a hard time going to sleep some night, just pull up our procedure manual. It is better than Ambien. <coughs> but it is publicly available on our website. And if we fast forward to 2011, clinical guidelines you can touch. The IOM, the panel, the, ins the institution formerly known as the IOM, now known as the National Academy of Medicine, um, convened a panel to look at panels. They convened a, a panel to look at establishing a guideline for guidelines. Uh, it's out on the web, and I will say uh, quite immodestly that there is no organization with which I'm familiar that comes closer to meeting those standards than the USPSTF, and we don't meet them perfectly. For example, down in the right lower quadrant of this cute little picture, which is here to remind me what it says, not for you to read, it says, <coughs> incorporate expert opinion and patient preferences and characteristics. We have a hard time figuring out how to do that. And actually, for expert opinion, the task force says no. If the evidence is insufficient, that's what we're going to say. If the evidence is insufficient. There are a whole bunch of other people out there who have expert opinion. Trust me, when we get done with the guideline, we have opinions. And if you take me offline and give me a glass of wine, I will tell you what mine is. <clears throat> but we will not publish them as official recommendations. Back to the future. 17 November 2009. My recollection, honestly, of this day, well, let me just say what happened on that day, which is Annals of Internal Medicine published this. The USPSTF recommends against routine screening mammography in women aged 40 to 49 years. The decision to start regular biennial screening mammography before the age of 50 years should be an individual one and take into account patient context, including the patient's values regarding specific benefits and harms, a grade C recommendation. Um, uh, I actually described the history of the task force in two eras, the BM and AM eras, <clears throat> the before mammography and after mammography eras. Now, my recollection of this day, I didn't even know this was coming out, honestly. We, were, we didn't publish drafts. Uh, we were at the mercy of the journal. Uh, whenever they decided it was time to come out, they published it. Um, typically, in advance of a publication, however, we would send a one-pager um, out to the press, you know, with some talking points, kind of say, this is coming, watch for this. Um, as it turns out, in that particular circumstance, that one-pager uh, went downtown. I don't know exactly where downtown is in Washington, D.C. <coughs> But it went downtown and never came back. <clears throat> and so when this came out in the journal, it came out completely unannounced. And uh, nobody knew it was coming. I didn't actually even know it was coming. I was in a hotel. This is my way of telling this story. I was in a hotel in, in, in Portland at a meeting of the BCSC, the Breast Cancer Surveillance Consortium, and the Evidence-Based Practice Center that worked on the breast cancer recommendation. We are planning in the next steps in research that might help inform the next mammography recommendation. And it was very early in the morning, and I was down in the whatever we call that room, fitness room, gym, whatever, and I was on this elliptical trainer, and I was watching the TV, and I got dissed twice, right in a row, that early in the morning. The first was somebody coming on, announcing who the sexiest man in America was, and it was, again, not me. <laughs> and I thought, this could be it for me. This is my last chance. I'm aging out here. Not going to happen. And then the secretary of HHS got on and said, ignore the task force. Uh, that was the first postcard. And by 9 o'clock that morning, sitting in the BCSC meeting, and in the APC meeting, I had a text from Larry King live on my phone um, wanting to interview me. It turns out pretty much anybody on the task force that they got a hold of um, had a text. By the next morning, you're not supposed to know this, OK? You're not supposed to know this. And so don't tell anybody. Yeah, right. <laughs> The traditional way of managing the press back then was that, that ARC actually did that for this. They had one person who took the phone calls and said, okay, well, so-and-so can handle that, and we'll send that out. And by the next morning, 
um, ARC had cut their ties with the task force um, and said, we have been advised that we are not supporting you in this recommendation. Uh, they cut us loose. 16 nerdy head, pointy academics floating out there <clears throat> at the mercy with actually no backup whatsoever uh, to manage the press onslaught in a very cra well-crafted assault. Our, our chair and vice chair were subpoenaed to Congress. We didn't, um, we didn't know how that worked, actually. And so we actually, on the side, in, in our own sort of private conference calls, were putting together a pool of money to support them to go testify before Congress. As it turns out, if Congress subpoenas you, they actually pay your way. <clears throat> so we didn't have to, <clears throat> we didn't actually have to pay. We didn't actually have to pay. It was a disaster. Um, much, you know, as they say, that which does not kill you makes you stronger. It did, and we're in a very much better uh, position today. That word routine meant something to us that it didn't mean to other people. This was our standard C language. What do you say about something for which the benefit just mildly outweighs the harms? And we said, don't do it all the time. Think about what you're doing. Think about how to do this. And we said it like that, and it came out like this. We intended to move from recommend to discuss, a vote in favor of shared decision making, but didn't go so well. Uh, with each subsequent recommendation, this is the same group that recommended against mammography for women in their 40s, stating the harms outweigh the benefits. No, actually we didn't. We were on the wrong side of that line. Got a lot of postcards on that one. Late 2009, the task force had already begun work on expanding transparency and improving communications. There was an unfortunate coincidence of the release of our 2009 breast cancer screening recommendation and a divisive battle in Congress about health care reform, which included this language. A group health plan and health insurance insurer offering group or individual health insurance shall provide coverage for and shall not impose any cost sharing requirements for task force A and Bs. And we gave mammography age 40 to 49 a C. So wake up call, words matter. We may be good at what we do. We aren't always good at what we say. And our audience is not limited to primary care clinicians. We decided to get better, so we pulled out only the best, the brightest, and the best looking. To, be, <laughs> to become a voice of the task force. Uh, but literally, part of our process right now, we actually have communications experts that are contracted with to help us out. And my very favorite part of that is whenever we finish voting on a recommendation, Frank, right now it's Frank, and I, I like Frank, he graduated from journalism at the University of Missouri, and he says he failed biology. <clears throat> and Frank comes up in front of the room, and we have to explain to him what we just decided and why. And honest to God, if we can't do that, we have failed. And we take the work group and say, you may not go to dinner tonight, and you must stay up all night fixing this problem. And that would be Mark. In spite of increasing visibility and the ramifications of the ACA, we labor on striving to review scientific evidence about preventive services and make recommendations based on that evidence free from advocacy, political pressure, cost or insurance considerations, and we are succeeding, mostly. I will come back to that. But speaking of postcards from the edge and being on the uncomfortable side of this equation, the 2014 evidence-based guideline for management of high blood pressure in adults, report from the panel members appointed to the 8th Joint National Committee, JNC-8. Very briefly, the process began in 2008 when the NHLBI convened their five panels um, to come up with evidence-based practice guidelines for CVD prevention. There was JNC-8, ATP-4, and there was one on obesity, uh, one on uh, lifestyle, and there was going to be one on risk, and, the, and then there was ultimately going to be a panel that synthesized all these together in CVD prevention. We were tasked. Um, this is this from the letter that I got. I got a letter appointing me to the panel. The JNC-8 will review and synthesize the latest available scientific evidence, update existing clinical recommendations, and provide guidance to busy primary care clinicians on the best approaches to manage and control hypertension to minimize patients' risk for cardiovascular and other complications. That was our explicit charge. And they said, we're going to do an evidence-based process. And you know, some of us were scratching our heads and thinking, well, what did JNC 1 through 7 do? <clears throat> well, as it turns out, 
um, they did a traditional consensus-based panel approach, as has all of the NIH cardiovascular disease panels have been consensus-based. But they said you're supposed to do it different this time. You're supposed to do the evidence-based approach. Our co-chairs were Suzanne Oparil, a, 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 really a, a, a dear scholar, a lady hypertension researcher um, from UAB, and Paul James. You know, Paul's a, a, a wonderful uh, human being and a, a great leader, and maybe in the audience today, Paul is the, I saw him last night, um, is uh, the chair of uh, family medicine at um, Iowa, and he was tasked with co-chairing this committee. Very simply, we're, we decided, after much labor, when to initiate drug treatment, or the, these are the questions, when to initiate drug treatment, how low should you go, and how do you get there? The research plan is substantially longer than this, but it is a traditional evidence-based approach to reviewing the literature and coming up with, but importantly, we said randomized controlled trials are the best way to test the effectiveness of an intervention. We're going to look for randomized controlled trials. We're going to look at age greater than 18, and they had to be treated for high blood pressure, not treated with an antihypertensive, but treated with an antihypertensive for blood pressure. And we were only going to look at health outcomes. We weren't going to look at intermediate outcomes. In 2013, we had a slight change of plans. Five years and literally hundreds of hours of conference calls later, the draft report was completed, and we had sent it out for peer review to federal agencies and some invited organizations and individuals. We had received all those public comments back. We were going through them one at a time, painstakingly saying, what's the disposition on this public comment? Oh, well, we need to reword that sentence. Or, no, this is a good point. Maybe we should change that. Or, uh, no, we're just going to say, we, we really appreciate what you said. Thanks for sharing that. Um, and so there's this conference call. They, they, they had a webinar. They said, we need, everybody needs to attend. It's an emergency webinar. Um, and NIH got on the phone and said, we're not going to publish these guidelines. Seriously? Five years? You're not going to publish these guidelines? And behind the scenes, they had decided that they were going to give these guidelines to the AHA and the ACC um, and let them finish or publish the guidelines. JNC wasn't necessarily that thrilled with that concept. It actually wasn't Trump. And so this is my postcard from Gary Gibbons, who was the head of the NHLBI at the time. And I will just read the points. I put it all in here so to make you believe it's real. Uh, Dear Mike, it doesn't actually say that. It says, Dear Dr. Lefevre, and how grateful we are for the service that you have provided. And down at the bottom it says, I'm writing to express my gratitude to you for the work that you contributed to the expert panel. And now that the work is complete, complete? We're not going to publish it and it's complete? Uh, the panel is dissolved, effective November 1, 2013. And so they had decided that the AHA should be the vehicle for getting these things done. And JNC had a lot of really serious conversations about that. And because there were some children of the 60s on there who questioned authority, we said, what is the point of this? Either the AHA is going to agree and say, we need to publish what you have already finished, in which case, you know, why should they? publish it under their name at the end of our five years of work, or they're not going to agree, and they're not going to publish the five years of work, but they weren't there. They didn't review the articles. They didn't have the conversations. They didn't do anything. So we just said, no, I don't think we're going to do this. And Gary Gibbons said, subsequently, we informed the panel and the public that the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology would take the lead on a collaborative partnership model with other professional societies to produce the guidelines based on the NHLBI evidence system. We are pleased that the other four panels, cholesterol, obesity, lifestyle, and risk assessment, have embraced the collaborative partnership model, working closely with us and the consortium of partner organizations during this exciting but challenging period of transition. And in the end, the dissolution of the NHLBI convened and NHLBI supported panel denotes that any work produced including but not limited to guidelines, clinical reviews, and presentations 
should not carry the NHLBI associated JNC designation or opinions attributable to the NHLBI without the explicit prior authorization of the NHLBI. Love, Gary. <laughs> Actually, because you can't read it, it does say sincerely, Gary Gibbons. And thus, the report from the panel members appointed to the 8th Joint National Committee, JNC 8, and there were lawyers involved in coming up with that title. There were lawyers involved. What really happened here? I don't know, I can't honestly tell you what happened. But I will tell you what I think. And don't repeat this or, well, no, you can repeat it. Um, I think they were running scared. I think that evidence confronted the edge. Um, and, the, and particularly the lipids panel and the hypertension panel were reaching conclusions based on the science which were very much conflicted with clinical expertise at the time. And they knew what happened to ARC back in the 1990s, and they didn't want to be involved. And, and quite honestly, it's a little bit of a disappointment to me that the premier science funding organization in the United States, from my perspective, ran from the science. Um, the, the controversial calculator, the AHA ACC calculator, that's actually the NIH calculator. The controversial lipid panel report that says don't treat to target because we have actually no evidence to treat to target, that's ATP4. Um, and JNC8 is JNC8. Mammography 2015. We recently released our, our draft recommendation. And from a grade standpoint, it, it didn't really change. We still give a C to, to women aged 40 to 49. And, we, and as recently as this Saturday, even though I'm actually the immediate past chair, and in theory that means I'm off the task force, but I missed a conference call of the chairs last year. And they decided that that was actually a formal position. Immediate past chair is what happens to you after your chair. And so I'm still, I think that my wife would say, I don't know what this past thing means. But as recently as last weekend, I was still actually personally working on writing the draft, uh, or I should say writing the final. Um, Congress has a habit of getting involved when mammography seems threatened. Back in 2009, you will recall that our, our chair and vice chair were, were subpoenaed and had to give congressional testimony. And then there was an, actually an amendment called the Mikulski Amendment to the Affordable Care Act. And I quote, the quote is actually important. The current, rec I mean, who made this up? Sorry, and don't repeat that. <laughs> um, the current recommendations, this is in 2009, the current recommendations of the USPSDF regarding breast cancer screening, mammography, and prevention shall be considered the most current other than those issued in or around November 2009. <laughs> now, if you get a team of lawyers together, what that means is when we publish our final in 2015, the Mikulski Amendment no longer applies because now the, the current recommendation will be the 2015 recommendation, and payers will not be congressionally mandated to cover mammography for women aged 40 to 49. There are currently two bills making their way through Congress, gaining steam, couched, couched in the context of <clears throat> we need to protect women, the USPSDF Transparency and Accountability Act was actually initially pushed by the American Neurologic Association. Uh, let me think about why that would be. And, um, um, and the radiologist. And it actually dramatically reforms the task force. And the PALS Act, I'll give you the quote from the National Consortium of Breast Centers. We are now one step closer to protecting women's access to mammograms. Senator Barbara Mikulski and Kelly Ayotte, a companion bill to H.R. Ayotte out of particular, that would block the USPS draft breast screening, screening recommendations. Contact your congressional representatives. I have it under fairly good rumor that the full page ads that are being taken out inside the beltway right now supporting this legislation are being paid for by Whole Logic. Whole Logic makes 3D mammograms. Um, and we gave that an eye. And they want it covered. 
Apparently, we also can be bad for business. Exact Sciences, which makes Cologuard the DNA test for screening. We didn't say don't use it. We, in the draft, basically just didn't give it our highest endorsement. Exact Sciences plunges more than 46% after USPSTF recommendations. And um, they're working hard to figure out how to influence the test force before the final. One more postcard from the edge and then an, uh, an unpersonal admonishment about your future in research. <laughs> Dear sir, by the way, this postcard didn't come directly to me. I've gotten a lot of postcards, some of which you would be very disappointed at how hostile they are. Um, this postcard actually came in um, to the task force, I think even through one of the, the work group leads. <clears throat> Dear sir, I now place you among the leader of the most detrimental medical professionals of our modern era. In that regard, you are on a par with Dr. Mengele, the only doctor to my knowledge whose ideas have the potential to cause more human misery is, now I just protected him in this quote here, you and or those on that committee that agree with this decision are a disgrace to the medical profession, humanity, and the Hippocratic Oath. Now let's guess what recommendation that came in on. Any candidates? That's for insufficient evidence for <laughs> screening for vitamin D. We didn't even say don't do it. Your future. We have many important research agendas in primary care, but I'm going to encourage you to embrace complexity. This is a complete change, by the way. I'm, well, I'm completely off the past. The search for a science of clinical care continues, and I will say, think for yourself and question authority. Primary care, I believe, is on the precipice right now. <clears throat> it can fall one of a couple different ways. Primary care is not easy, it is hard. The questions are not simple, they are complex. And the answers must be integrative, not reductionist. And the very nature of that last statement says that that part of the science of clinical care is not gonna be conducted by anybody else. It is only gonna be conducted by those in primary care and those affiliated with or loyal to, just by the nature that it must be integrative, not reductionist. But you'll be looking for answers on the edge. Expect postcards. <laughs> I think we have time. I know there are people in the audience who have things to say. Let me assure you that I can neither see you nor hear you. <laughs> but there are people wandering up and down the aisles with microphones, which means I might be able to hear you even if I can't see you. Oh, Mike, that was fantastic. Uh, Bernadette Wakeman, you, you can't see me, but you know me well. I just have to say this is one of the most uh, stimulating and inspiring and uh, uh, impressive presentations that has uh, just evoked a lot of personal feelings for me. Um, the first one is that I'm very happy that uh, you and I collaborated on the RADIUS study. It kind of warmed you up for these kind of postcards, it, it appears. Uh, the second thing is I, I want to say something about you personally. Uh, I, I think anyone who's listened to this talk knows uh, the kind of person you are from a science point of view. They probably don't know what you're like as a doctor, and I do. We were in medical school, residency, chief residence fellows, and collaborated together before I left the department. You took care of my family. I know what kind of doctor you are. You're one of the most personal and uh, thoughtful and uh, person who engages personal preferences and values of any doctor I know. And I think it's so ironic these postcards that you get. And I think we owe you an enormous grat gratitude for the kind of leadership that you've exerted in the US, 
PSTF Task Force. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Barney. Very kind of you to say, and of course, some of the early postcards were all your fault, and so on. <laughs> I practiced family medicine for 35 plus years. In the early, late 70s, early 80s, I embraced Paul Frame's clinical analysis uh, of uh, preventive services and in my practice demonstrated high levels of screening. At the end of my career, um, due I think to the multiplication of guidelines of lesser and lesser uh, uh, impact and uh, my embracing shared decision making as a, a method. My, I became a bad doctor. My screening rates went down. And uh, actually, they, uh, our organization was even uh, docking pay for people who didn't meet the uh, maximizing guidelines, such as mammography. So I, w I wonder what your comments are about the current state of the implementation of guidelines in the primary care world and, and the potential conflict with uh, implementing shared decision making in, in practice. Um, Mark assured me that there would be really hard questions. Um, so uh, let me just tell you one of my um, favorite administrative sayings. I've actually uh, spent a career in that world as well, and my, and it is that, um, and it's not original. Trust me, but I, I think it actually goes all the way back to our fellowship. And, um, if I actually remember when I first heard this, it is that all change is perceived as loss by someone. I'll say that again. All change is perceived as loss by someone. And when I talk about this, I say, and if you don't believe me, move the coffee pot in your office. <laughs> Somebody's going to quit, right? And we have very well-established and firmly held beliefs. Who, who would have thought, before JNC-8 published the recommendations, that there was not a single clinical trial out there that supported a systolic blood pressure target of 140? Nobody, because if you say something often enough and with enough authority, it becomes truth. That's one of the dangers of, of incorporating expert opinion into policy, is that you say it often enough, it becomes truth. And then the resistance to change when science confronts that is enormous. And so changing the way people provide care, I think is very, very difficult. And there are a thousand different reasons, many of them very, very legitimate, and very legitimate uh, criticisms. Well, that's not my patient. I agree with that. This is my patient, and I don't always follow the guidelines, right? So I think research, um, is a step away from clinical guidelines and, and even a tad bit less likely to directly impact that edge and, and see a change in care. And I think guidelines are even harder. And there's a fair bit of research on guidelines that shows how difficult that change in behavior really is. Um, I think that it's hard. And patient preferences, I, I think incorporating patient preferences, my bias, <coughs> into the decisions is going to be the result of the patients, not the medical community. Um, and I, I think it's, it's really can be attributed to the information age and the internet, honestly. I mean, people don't come to the equation. I mean, many, many do, don't get me wrong. But people don't come into this relationship now a blank slate, just ready to trust. They want to know what you think, but they also really want to know what you think about what I just read. Um, if there's to be shared decision making, for women from mammography age 40 to 49, it's going to be because the women heard that, they, that it's not all good and there may be some bad, and I'd like to talk about it. Not so much because the provider said, um, let's talk about this. Now, that's going to happen, too. I, I hear it increasingly. Uh, but I, I actually think that most of the change related to patient preferences is going to be because of a movement from the patient side more than from the doctor side. Hi, I'm Emily Godfrey. I, um, I work at the University of Washington Department of Family Medicine, and thank you for your talk. I was wondering, um, 
with the guidelines that just came out on mammography and the American Cancer Society, it's made a lot of news. There are a number of articles in JAMA and kind of a background and the reasoning behind their current recommendation, which is now to start mammography age 45 annually to age 54 and then biannually. Um, I recognize you were not on that committee, but as a primary care doc who now is gonna have patients come to me and ask about those guidelines, I've been following the US Preventive Service Task Force guidelines. How do we, first of all, I guess I'm interested if you do know anything about the ACS recommendations. Do they look at different science than the US Preventive Service Task Force? And as primary care providers, other than just having like a dartboard as to which guideline we follow, how do we reconcile that with our patients? Great question. Um, I'll try to not make it too long an answer because there are probably more great questions. Um, I have been often asked, um, how do you, you know, how should we uh, reconcile USPSTF guidelines with other guidelines that are out there? And, and it's been a fairly simple and straightforward answer, which is you just pay attention to the USPSTF um, and forget all those other guidelines. That's uh, it's a little bit hard to do out on the front line. I actually, um, I'm not sure Mark even had this in the introduction. I am a family doctor. Um, uh, I'm an academic family physician. In that context, the family physician comes first. I, I, I still have my four half days of clinic every week, at least when I'm not traveling. Um, and uh, I still do inpatient medicine and finally gave up OB about three years ago because it's a young person's sport. I see these people in clinic. I, I'm confronted with the, the challenges that you have in, in rec reconciling sort of public opinion. It's not my job to talk women into anything, honestly, I, particularly as it relates to mammography. I, I'm, I feel strongly that, that we have oversold mammography. Um, and, and we've been telling women for quite a while now that you're really stupid. I mean, there's only two ways you can do this. You can have an annual mammogram starting at age 40 or you're really stupid. Those are sort of the two. I'd like to refer you to to Christy Ashwanden, who actually published, that's A-S-C-H-W-A-N-D-E-N, I'm not supposed to plug a journalist, but I will, um, who uh, published actually in JAMA Internal Medicine why I'm not gonna have a mammogram, and she just published, I think it was in, it wasn't Mother Jones, uh, if you look her up and Google mammography and Christy Ashwanden, she just published something about why we're never gonna reconcile the differences between these guideline panels because it's not science. The difference is not science, the difference is values. And this from somebody who says, I'm not ever gonna have a mammogram. I've looked at this, I understand the science well, and my values say the best way to protect my health is to not ever have a mammogram. I don't think that the American Cancer Society and the USPSTF are saying di very different things at all. There's one little sidebar to that. I think. We are both saying we believe mammography works. We're both saying it increases with age, the benefit increases with age. Uh, we're both saying the benefit in the 40s is small. Um, and our take on that is therefore it's a C and you should make a decision for yourself. American Cancer Society said go ahead and start at age 45. You know the one piece of science that they used to come up with, there are two things that they did. All right, three things, back up. I love Otis Brawley. Um, Otis published about three years ago in JAMA an article that says this is how the ACS is going to do our guidelines going forward. And it's in much more an explicit evidence-based process. This is their first product. This is the first time they've used that process. And Otis Brawley a couple of days ago was quoted in the press as saying something, this is a real change for the, I'm paraphrasing this so really don't quote this. This is a real change for the ACS. We're telling women the truth. Um, <laughs> it's not far off the real quote. I, I, I should have pulled it up. Um, we never used to call harms harms. We're calling them harms. We used to call them limitations. And we really don't have that much science. And we've oversold mammography. The sidebar uh, to Otis Brawley is if you haven't read his book, How We Do Harm, read his book. Uh, I've sold more of his books than he has. Uh, it's, <laughs> It's, um, it's, re it's really an excellent book that starts off with, with 
um, a, a woman, woman showing up, an African-American woman showing up in, in Amory in the emergency room, and he was called down to see with her breast in a paper bag. And, and he talks about disparities, and he talks about how much money we're wasting on this other stuff. He talks about how the business plan for doing PSAs. So they decided to do science. They commissioned a study on, from the BCSC, which I really can't go into, that said, well, maybe the stage changes if you do it annually in the 40s, but not so much. And it's actually, the recommendation isn't 45 to 54, it's 45 to menopause. And then post-menopause, it changes. And if you don't know when menopause is, because you don't have a uterus, uh, then 54. So it's really menopause, 45 to 54. And they're hanging in there with annual. And of course, there's the pushback from all those who says, no, keep doing annual mammography. Your job, my job in clinic, is to tell people, we don't really know for sure. We think that there may be some benefit for mammography in the 40s. It's probably quite small. And here are the downsides. And they relate to the false positives and the callbacks. 50% of women, by the way, everybody should be telling their patients this. 50% of women who have annual or even biennial mammography in their 40s are going to get called back at least one time. The 50% false positive rate. They need to know that so they don't panic. Um, and we do almost the same number of biopsies on women in their 40s as we do in their 60s, but we find way more cancer in the 60s. So you're going to have a lot more biopsies that aren't necessary. So forth. And it's a value judgment. If they say, if they want everything done, order a mammogram. I'm not trying to talk anybody out of it. And if they say, mm, not so much, I'll give you my PSA talk because it's one of my very favorite quotes from a patient. At the end of the PSA talk, I say, I'm going to describe two people for you. And if you can tell me which of these two people you're most like, I can tell you whether to have a PSA. On the one side, people say to me, um, look, doc, I feel well. If you're not sure you can make, do me more good than harm, you should leave me alone. On the other side are people who say, I'm afraid of cancer. I worry all the time about cancer. If I have a cancer, I want to know about it. I want to do something about it. I understand that there are risks and uncertainties. And these people should not have a PSA, and these people should. And my very favorite answer to that question was a guy who said, Mike, you just described perfectly me and my wife. <laughs> it's not always straightforward. So reconcile, I don't think they say it's different things. I, I think that 45, is, if you're going to start in your 40s, it doesn't have to be 40 or 50. It could easily be 45. Uh, they re, you know, there's nothing magic about 50, uh, except for that's the way the studies were done. Um, so you know, 60, don't let people bail out when they're 60. If they're tired of having mammography, say you've just reached your stride. <laughs> hey there. Rear to your left. Uh, now, University of Colorado, I share your uh, respect for Otis Brawley and the experience with the uh, two P PSA types. Uh, uh, I'm quite taken by your concluding slides, and I also am quite taken and appreciative of the way you've used your personal biography to teach, to teach us this morning. I'd like to ask you to extend your personal biography just a little further. Describe for us how your your thinking changed toward complexity. How my thinking changed towards complexity. Um, well, I, I'm on the FMA health thing, right? Uh, um, I'm the, in the, on the practice tactic team uh, under the tutelage. It's got to be out there somewhere. Bob Phillips, you know, I was on the, the group that I think I see Frank. Does he Frank in there? Uh, uh, that put together the, the, the role definition for family medicine and the foil. And, and, and that's where I, I think we are right now. We're teetering on this edge of whether we really embrace what the population needs. And the, and the population needs doctors who embrace complexity. Um, they, they need primary care physicians who don't, who don't just say, well, let me take care of the easy stuff and I'm going to refer the other stuff and not worry about what happens after I refer you. They, um, and, and the corollary to that is that the demographic shape uh, of, is, is not pyramid, and in about 10 years, it's going to look even worse. It's going to be a big box, and at the top of that box is me, um, meaning the baby boomers are aging into that age where multiple morbidity is the rule rather than the exception, and it's complicated. And taking care of those people is complicated. And you can't use a reductionist science and say, 
I know how to take care of this person, if I know how to take care of their heart, and I know how to take care of their kidneys, and I know how to take care of their lungs, and I know how to take care of their brain, then I know how to take care of them. We need to figure out how to take care of that person, and I think it's growing more complex as the medical knowledge of each reductionist organ is expanding. Um, it makes it more complicated for us to take care of people. Um, and we're the only ones who can look at that from the standpoint of people. And so that's why I'm saying embrace, I say it, I say it from a practice standpoint as well. Don't, we can't be backing away from taking care of sick people. That, that's what we're supposed to be about. And, and they're not just sick, you know, if they're sick because they only have high blood pressure, anybody can do that, really, you know. Uh, if they're sick because they've got a messed up life at home and, and the, their wife just left them and, and they have three diseases and they have ten drugs, there should be a cap, about six drugs, by the way. So I think after that you shouldn't be allowed to take any more drugs. Um, nobody else is going to do that. It has to be us. So we have to embrace complexity both from a practice standpoint but from a research standpoint because we don't know how to do it. I mean, I, I mean we're, everybody in this room is contributing to sort of how to, how to do that, how to take care of complex human beings. But, uh, but um, you know, that's, I think that the field is ripe because of the change in health, health care, um, and the people that we're taking care of. It's just not the same as what it used to be. So I'm encouraging you. And don't, don't back away from the edge, by the way. Uh, the edge is a great place to be. Hi, Jeff Borkin from Brown University in Rhode Island. First of all, thank you for your fantastic talk and for your courageous role. Um, you know, we often don't talk about the intersection of science, business, and politics. Um, and I was just wondering, what do you think would be necessary, required, helpful for young researchers? Is it something that should we, we should have a required course in kind of uh, researcher self-defense that can help them when they go out? Because I think that um, we actually are doing a disservice in our training programs to not be speaking more about these topics? That's a really interesting question. Um, <clears throat> about three years ago, or four years ago, one of the, one of the members of the communication team, I wish I could remember the name of the book. I, I, somehow or another, I'll get it to Priscilla, and it'll be available. I mean, it's a, it's a book about um, talking with the media about your research. And researchers hate talking to the media about their research. They view this as a, I'm going to say something stupid and they're going to ignore. And it, you know, my work is way too complex for people to understand and yada, yada, yada. And it's actually, you know, I think that, that we need to learn how to communicate the importance of what we're doing and the results of what we're doing. And that's not, you didn't get that course in medical school. I promised, well, I certainly didn't get that course in medical school. I promise you that. But I think it changes everything about the way you think about the research that you're doing and the communication you do. So um, I would say communications. I can even give you the name of a little book um, that was given to me about read this. And it wasn't targeted at like the work that we've been doing on the task force or anything else. It's targeted to all you and your research that you're doing and how to communicate the research to the public. I think it's actually imperative that we be able to do that. Yes, mine. Over here, you recognize my voice. This is Paul James, um, University of Iowa. Um, you know, you talked about the, the edge and the postcards from the edge, and, and I'm going to label that the outside edge because there are those postcards that come from the inside edge, which are oftentimes the patients related to our incorporating their values, uh, preferences, into, into our decision making. I want to make the work that, that you've done, so it, it, it's almost perhaps inaccessible to some of our first time attenders that I could never do the work that Dr. Lefevre's doing because he's such a big name in the field. But I'm, I'm thinking if you and I talked a little bit about the importance of this work and how everyone in this room could be a part of of using evidence or creating measures that support uh, better clinical care, actually doing the three things I think you started your talk with to, to relieve suffering or to prevent future suffering, um, that there, there may be whole new methodologies that, that, that we could talk about that, 
that each person in this room could grab a piece of um, so that they could be part of that edge. One of those edges, either, either on the side of patient-centered care and values and preferences, or, or the more evidence-based side that relates to policy. And I, I just wonder what, what thoughts you would have for young investigators in that regard. Uh, a couple of comments. Thank, thank you very much. I, I certainly can't add to anything that you just said with any meaning, which won't keep me from talking. Um, <laughs> My kids would tell you that too, really. Um, I'm going to tell you a very, very, very short story. I, when, I, when I was, <clears throat> how many people out here know Robin Blake? Uh, so there are a few hands that still go up. And, and, and Robin and, and, and Jerry Perkoff were, were in charge of the fellowship that, that we, we took or that we did. And, and, and <clears throat> it was sponsored by Robert Wood Johnson. And, and Annie Lee Schuster was the person who came out and did the site visit and said, make sure that these guys were doing the, the job that they were supposed to do. And I still, I just remember the dumbest things, and, and I've forgotten so many important things. I still remember talking with Annie Lee Schuster, and I don't know, we were talking about Robin, and I said, well, one of the problems with Robin is that he's just too good. Um, you know, it's really hard to look at somebody who, who's such a, an excellent clinician, uh, who's thoughtful, who understands, you know, kind of both sides of an issue, who, who who is so smart in, in this clinical epidemiology that I'm supposed to be learning and all that kind of stuff. And, and she kind of scratched her head and she said, well, I knew Robin from a long time ago. And uh, the implication being that Robin wasn't that special. Um, I didn't, you know, I've been tumbling through life. I, I, I started as a, as a junior researcher without a clue about the direction that I was, I was supposed to be headed. And, and, and the winds just sort of blew me in, in a particular direction. Um, uh, so, I tr trust me, I didn't start this gig with anything more than anybody in this room has. I just sort of took advantage of the opportunities that came my way along the way. Um, I, I said, that sounds fun, that sounds interesting, I'm going to stay with this. Um, and, and it sort of weaved its way in different directions. Um, and, and science builds on itself, and, and the most trivial of all studies oftentimes being, you know, combines with other studies, and the next thing you've know, got the next building block, and it goes from there. You got to do research because you love doing research. Uh, <clears throat> if you're going to do research because you think that you're just about to do the study that changes the way healthcare is provided in America, <coughs> then I would go see patients. Because <clears throat> the odds on anybody in this room doing that are pretty small. Um, and there just aren't very many of those studies. They may happen, but I can think of one, uh, maybe two, that by itself sort of changes the face of healthcare. So be encouraged, um, learn, look to your mentors, team up. Bernard got up and talked to me to say that one of the, the most impressive things about working with Bernard early on was, was his ability to network and saying, well, we don't have it here. I got to find somebody. In order, we're going to do this study. I got to find somebody who can do this. And ended up with, you know, a perinatologist at WashU and a statistician in Minnesota who we didn't end up using. But nonetheless, um, uh, sort of find people out there with similar interests, and they're going to want to network with you about those interests and and help build that knowledge and research understanding. So do it because you like asking questions and you like trying to find the answers. You don't really need any more than that, Paul. I and mean, I really do think. You like it, you, you challenge authority. You think for yourself, you challenge authority. You've got questions you think need to be answered and the answers aren't out there. How am I gonna help answer this question? And then look to your, your mentors to help guide you along that pathway. Okay, hi, I'm Fern Haug from the University of Virginia. And uh, thank you for your wonderful presentation. And I uh, felt particularly uh, affiliated with your discussion about being, um, getting these postcards because I'm a member of the American Academy of Pediatrics Task Force on SIDS. And as you all know, when you do your safe sleep uh, recommendations, I'm part of that group that comes out with those recommendations. And the one area there was, is the bed sharing recommendation. And so you know, we have researchers out there who use the same case control study results and say it's safe to bed share under such and such circumstances. And the task force has been very uh, firm on um, 
uh, saying that bed sharing is not not safe and uh, for and it's not it's not the recommended sleep location for infants. And so um, I wanted to ask you how you cope with getting those. Uh, Postcards, and I've, you know, our task force has been really criticized in the literature. We get those nasty notes and cards, and uh, I, there was even a poster at the American Academy, the uh, Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine conference that I was invited to speak at actually last year. There was an actual poster that uh, individually attacked all of the members of the task force, and, and it was kind of interesting to see. So, I, I mean, I, you know, we cope with it, but I'm just wondering how you cope with, you know, these nasty <laughs> things, and how, you know, what your advice would be about that. Thank you. Um, I see people drifting, and I look at my watch, and I know Mark is going to put the hook out and put me off the stage in just a moment. So let me just, in a bizarre kind of way. Um, um, I'm just going to say that I, I carry a couple of poems in my my pocket, actually, um, um, and um, in, in one of them, and it's when I really sort of need just a little break and, and kind of center myself again. Actually, one of them isn't a poem; it's actually a quote by Mr. Rogers. Um, believe it or not, it's, 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 a, it's a lovely quote. And the second one is the poem uh, "If" by Rudyard Kipling. And, and, um, and the, the first couple lines of that are, um, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs but blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you but make allowance for their doubting too, that's how I cope. Thank you very much.